Good evening. Uh, we're waiting a little little bit. Uh, we've got a little technical difficulties there, and I, I'm sure I'll, I'll be letting know when it's when it's fixed. But uh, for the ones that uh, haven't been here, or the ones that forget, like me, uh, we are in James, uh, and we're going to start the around the thirteenth verse. We good? Okay, all right. Man, it sure is good to be here. I'll tell you, you know, me and Allison was talking the other day. This week has just went by like a blur. And, it, you know, it's one thing after another after another. And to be able to come here on a Wednesday evening and just sit and relax and with people that you love and, and, and study God's Word is just wonderful. And I'm so glad that we had that opportunity to do this. Um, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer before we start. Lord, my Father in heaven, thank you for each and every blessing that you give us, Lord. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your forgiveness, Lord. Lord, as we study this book of James, we study about sin and hearing and speaking and listening, Lord. Let us take it to heart. Let us consume it like a sponge, Lord, and let us be able to live it. Lord, thank you for your son who died upon the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, as I said, we, uh, we are in chapter 1, verse 13 through 15. And let me go ahead and start reading. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. Oh, let me read, go ahead and read 15, I'm sorry. Then when desires has conceived to give birth to sin, and sin, when it comes to full grown, brings forth death. You know, let me make this point. God takes no delight in any sin at all. It is natural for one part, for the part of some, to hold God responsible and accuse him of producing a condition which results hardships and trials. You know, it didn't take long after Adam and Eve was on this earth before that to happen, as we learn in Genesis. You know, Satan tempted Eve to eat of that apple. He lured her. Yep, she ate it. And she turned around and said to Adam, Hey, come here, let me try this. He tried it. Well, you know God knew about it. And he confronted Adam. And when he confronted Adam, this is what Adam said. All right, how do I go back here? Yep, there you go. Okay. Adam said this in Genesis 3 and 6. The man replied, the woman who you, and I did the underlining because I wanted to preference on that, you put here with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, so I ate it. Okay, what's wrong with that? First of all, Adam sinned the first time by taking a bite of the apple. So he's got one sin. And then he flips it. Hey, it wasn't my fault. You're the one that put her here. 
You're the one to put her on the earth, and she gave me the apple. Well, don't we have choices? I don't see, I haven't read in the Bible where she, he was forced to take a bite. He had a choice. He didn't have to eat it. You know, this example is good in two reasons. One is the fact that in this verse, it's applying to God where God does not know evil. He does not tempt anyone, anyone of evil. But the other thing, we can learn a lesson here on our own. We don't need to blame someone for our mistakes. We don't need to make excuses for our mistakes. We're going to read later on in John where all we need to do, what we need to do is ask for forgiveness. That's what he wants us to do. So Adam has got these already stacked the sins on top of each other. Every evil act is by some justified on the grounds that God creates our bodies and places in them desire which we should not have done is to regard their fulfillment as sin. Such reasoning, of course, done by those who convincedly forget that there is fundamental difference between proper use and abuse of privileges. No one may properly say, I am tempted by God. The question has been asked, God tempts us to do evil in any sense, remotely or otherwise. And James affirms that God, God tries men for the purpose of determining their faith. But he denies that the temp, temptations or the purpose of seducing them for sins. God proves us. He tests our faith. We read that in the very first verses when we were talking about trials, how he tests our faith. He wants our faith to grow. He wants our faith to grow, to grow our perseverance. And also, we understand that we get wisdom from God as we read last week. Let me make sure I'm doing this right. In Deuteronomy 8 and 2, remember how for these 40 years the Lord your God has directed all your journeys in the wilderness so as to test you by affliction. To know that was in, what was in your heart to keep his commandments or not. We can also read in, in Judges 2, I need to go there, yeah. Judges uh, 2 and 22, I believe that's what it says, yeah, 2 and 22, they will be made to test Israel to see whether or not they will keep to the way of the Lord and continue in, in it as their ancestors did to argue that God is the source of temptation is to maintain that God takes delight in evil. On those occasions when God allows people to be tempted it is not because he deserves to search out and expose their weaknesses. God gives without reproach. God's purpose and may not allow, allow always be observed to the human level. In other words, we may not understand it. We may, it's greater than us. But he desires for goodness, not evil, to produce for his people. James maintains that the one who excuses his own transgression is blaming God to lure him into sin. It's all wrong. 
The desire of the sinner is his own flesh. In a source from which his rebellion against God surfaces. Uh, as we read in chapter 14, we can learn the resource, the, uh, the real sources. The temptation is man, he is man, is drawn away. He is drawn away by number two, his own lust. And he is enticed. Desire seeking satisfaction prompts to sin and the individual is caught, trapped, or as a fisherman would say, hooked. All right, let's stop right there. I know we've got some fishermen in here. And I know that there's a lot more to fish and these guys are serious and just dropping a worm in. I mean, if you're if you go bass fishing, you know they want you got to know the temperature of the water, the way the wind's blowing. Is it hot or cold? Have you got, are you going to be fishing how deep of water? All this stuff. But one of the most important things, if you're bass fishing, let's just use bass fishing as an example, is bait. A lure. Now what are you going to pick? Are you going to pick the lure that matches your shirt because you want to cord, color coordinate? Are you going to pick your favorite color? Are you going to pick what that environment of what you're fishing in is a pond or river or stream that you think that that, that fish is going to bite on? Yeah, the last one. Here, you're going to pick what you think, what you've had success with before. You cast, it goes into the weeds where the fish are hiding. It goes over the rocks, maybe where the fish is up against a rock or in between rocks. That fish sees it. Bam. You got him. Now, I know you fishermen, it's bigger if it doesn't get in a boat with your stories, but anyway, you got him. Well, Satan is no different. Satan will wait at the right time. At the right moment, he uses the right bait, whatever it is, and he hooks us. We must stay away from those places. We must stay away from those people that lures away from God, that lures us away from church and our church family. So long as we are in flesh, it is impossible to avoid sin. John said, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us if we say that we have not sinned. We make him a liar, and his word is not in us. John 1, 8 through 10. If we say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we acknowledge our sin, he is faithful. And just as we forget our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You see, right there where it says in verse 9, if we acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. That's all. That is all. Adam had to do. I messed up. I sinned and asked for forgiveness. That's all he had to do. And to put it in today's perspective, that's all we have to do. 
Oh, we need to learn from our sin and not do it again, but all we have to do is ask for forgiveness. Now, this is a, this is a tongue twister, so bear with me on this, what I wrote here. One simply adds sin to sin in denying sin. It is a sin to say that one does not sin if we confess our sins he is faithful, faithfully and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. I don't know what happened here? In John one and John one, First uh, uh, John one and nine. I put the red in there to emphasize it. If we knowledge our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrong doing. Children of God should remember that the devil, the roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. And this be, ev this be ever on the guard against his evil tricks. In verse 15, we, we uh, talked about sin itself. Sin is like a child. When, he, when sin is born, then it produces it matures. It becomes full grown. And then it goes into full development. Sin, when it becomes fully developed, it produces death in the individual who harbors it. Evil desires leads to the, the birth of sin, and the sin gives birth to death. Do we have any questions before we go read any more? Any comments? Okay. All right, I'm going to read uh, 16 and 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light with whom there is no variation or shadows of turning. James is writing to his brethren and telling them not to let themselves be deceived into thinking that God creates temptation and sin. You see, Satan successfully succeeds people when he prompts them to abandon their principles of Christianity. Paul declared that all of the treasures of the wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. And he warns us not to be deluded with the influence of speech and the wisdom and philosophy and traditions of men. The gift the perfect gift, the complete gift, comes from heaven. James 3, we can read James, I'm sorry. Yeah, James 3, 14 and 15. But if you have bitter, jealous, and selfish, selfish uh, in your heart, do not boast and be false in the truth. Wisdom of this kind does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual. John 3 and 31. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is off, 
I'm sorry, the one is of the earth, is earthly, and speaks of earthly things. But the one who comes from heaven is above all. No, that's not right. I put this up. I just I did just read this, but I put this up here just as a reminder. All good giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no alteration or shadows or shadow causing by change. Such giving and gifts are those that come from above. What this means is the motive which prompts such giving as well as, a, as gifts themselves creates not with man who can never approach such high ideas. In other words, we won't have that thought process. We don't have that mental capability in giving as God does. Good giving and good gifts that are complete and perfect are from above. They come down to us from the divine source, the Father of light. In the text, in the text we refer to the heavenly bodies, sun, the moon, the stars, which provide light for us. God shapes, God shapes the Father of these heavens bodies because he is the, the ultimate source of him. And the word Father, in a sense, is of the Creator. God is light in he, God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. Uh, John 1 and 4 and 5. We read, Through Him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Any questions? Yes. Absolutely, yes, we do all sin, and absolutely we are forgiven if, if we are a child of God, and we, we have that often opportunity to ask forgiveness because we're a child of God. Uh, the, the one thing that, and I agree with everything you said, the one, game, one thing we've got to be mindful of is we need not to, we need not to make that sin over and over and over or it's not doing us any good. We need to learn from our sins to do to do better. But yes, uh, we all sin. It does not matter. So yes, absolutely. Anybody else? All right, let me put my eyes on and read some more. All right, uh, chapter, uh, verse 18. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first 
fruits of his creatures. James said that God brought us forth by the word of truth. That he did, what, what did he mean by, the, by bringing forth? Was he calling attention to the birth of mankind? Maybe his creation was the subject, the subject was creation? That might follow from the father of his light. It's, it's a phrase means that God is the creator of the heavenly lights. Give his roots in Judaism. James may have been referring to the birth of of God's people in Israel. Either of these possibilities is not to be dismissed lightly, dismissed lightly, but the phrase by the word of the truth takes a concept in a different direction. James found himself in company with other authors of the New Testament who thought of becoming a Christian in terms of the new birth. We can, there, there's a lot of research. I didn't put it on the screen. If somebody wants to write it down, John 3, 1 through 8. And that's the reason I didn't put it on the screen because it was a lot of verses and um, we would have had tons of slides. But let me, let me um, Titus, Titus 3 and 5. Not because of any righteousness deed we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the bath of rebirth and, and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And in First uh, Peter 1 and 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is his great mercy gave us new birth to the living hope the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The word of truth is the, is the meaning by which one comes to put faith in Christ and to act on faith by obeying. James said they had become a kind of first fruit among his creatures. If you recall the first fruit is an agriculture economy in Israel was brought in the beginning, was, was both the beginning of the harvest and was promised that most of the harvest would be coming. Giving the first fruit around Israel was very important for God's people to realize he was the source of blessing when the harvest came. In Deuteronomy 26, 2, we can read about the first fruit. You shall take some first fruit of the various products of the soil which you harvest from the land the Lord your God is giving you. Put them in a basket and go to the place which the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling place for his name. You see, the readers of James were holy to him like the first fruit of Israel was holy to them they were themselves saved from sin they were reborn they held forth outlook and it, that additional abundance would follow because of Christ's multitudes would enjoy the blessing that came to those who endured The things that we can learn. Oh, I didn't do very good on that one. I'll read it to you. Sorry about that. Uh, the, th the three things that we can learn. It was God's will that those who, whom James wrote should become his children. That was the first one. These become his children by being born by the word of truth, the gospel. And the last one, those who thus did become the first fruit in pledge 
of the great harvest. As we're getting ready to read verse 19 and 20, at this point, he was already to explore into, into the ethical implications of such law. James had previously addressed the trials of the readers and the results needing for the endurance. To allow himself to be in control by the desires to yield to the pleasures of the, the moment and <clears throat> in the abandon of the crown of life. God has promised ethics have been a part of the doctrine all along, but the author now turns his attention to the way of life that God demands from those who he brought forth by the word of truth. So let me read 19 and 20. Yes, 19 and 20. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the right righteous of God. James will return to the discussion of the way of the tone, maybe blessing or curse of God, God's people put on. <clears throat> but but for now, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. The order of hearing, speaking, and becoming angry is not one that we would expect. In concept, most people image that anger comes first. One sees or hears something to inflame them, it inflames their anger. Being angry, he trends to restore to ill-chosen words. I've been there. You know, you, you think you heard what you heard or you seen what you seen, you don't know the whole story or you're not listening like you're supposed to. And you start boiling. And you say things you shouldn't say. James, James' warning might have been closer to the normal course of events that had he had abolished his readers to be quick to hear, to be slow to become angry, and to be slow to speak. Perhaps James implied that carelessness listening can yield harsh words, which in turn can generate more anger. James implied that the words can, can be the source of anger as well as its results. Sometimes the longer a person talks, the more angry he becomes. Or you become. I should say that. In Proverbs, it says, where words are many, sin is not wanting. But those who restrain their lips do well. And this one right here, you, you know, you got, you got to think the Lord's got a little bit of sense of humor here. Proverbs 12 and 18. Uh, this reminds me of a couple of people. The babble of some people is like a sword thrust, but the tongue of the wise is healing. You see, man has two ears, but only one tongue, so we ought to be able to listen twice as much as what we could speak. We should hear more than what we speak. There's things that we can learn from this. I hope you guys can see this. I hope I didn't mess that up. 
I wrote down six things that we could learn from listening well, quickly, slow to speak and slow to anger. Things that we could use. To be quick to listen means we trust God's timing. We don't have to win the argument now. We can share our perspective, then leave it up to the Lord to show them our side. I really miss that. Huh? We realize that even if we disagree, there are things we can learn by listening to them. Even if we only learn that others see the issues differently than we do, even if we learn how someone else struggles with an issue differently, even if we learn how we might help someone. Did it, did it go? When we share our thoughts, we share them with gentleness and without anger. For some reason, we tend to think that if we speak forcefully or with anger, they'll come around to our perspective. Anyway, if we get loud, you ever been in that, somebody gets louder and louder, it's, I can hear you, I can hear you, you, got, you but you think you're going to change their mind by getting louder? No. The fourth one? To be quick to listen, we remember that we have blind spots. You remember how David asked God to send brothers to rebuke him? David considered this a blessing. Number five, to be quick to listen means we genuinely want to try to understand what the other person is saying. This means we are really wanting to try to see the issue from their perspective. That's, a, that's very hard for a lot of us to do that because we, uh, a lot of us are stubborn and we, we have our minds made up, but we need to do that. We need to look at it from others' perspective. And the last one, to be quick to listen, we try to be humble. A humble person doesn't think he knows or sees every issue perfectly. A humble person can learn from anyone. Well, folks, it's about time to call it quits. I am going to stop right there, and we will pick up next week, Lord willing. So I appreciate your attention. Thank you.